A crucial World Trade Organization meeting has been extended by a day as delegates try to get international trade back on track. Hello, I'm Arnold Nido and this is The Heat. The WTO Director General Ngozi Okonjo Iwela urged members to go the extra mile to craft an agreement, and in fact, they are going an extra day. The meeting of trade ministers had been due to finish on Wednesday, but will now continue until Thursday afternoon. We begin with this report from John Beaver in Geneva. After not being held for several years, in part because of the pandemic, the WTO ministerial conference will go on an extra day. There are a huge number of pressing topics to cover. Everything from food insecurity to vaccine manufacturing, fishing and e-commerce has been discussed at length here in Geneva. With just hours of the conference left, it was decided to keep it going for another day. Organisers claiming that they were close to making breakthroughs. Significant progress has been made. We're not far from agreements on many of these topics, and they determined that there was value in keeping ministers in town a little bit longer. It's not an easy decision to make, of course. People have travel plans. Um, people want to get out of here. Um, but uh, the, the determination was there are um, good prospects for agreements, and that um, talks should continue. The World Trade Organization makes decisions by consensus and trying to get more than 160 countries, many with differing priorities, to agree to deals is no easy task. Many have expressed concern that the WTO is not keeping up with the times, that it's now out of date in a world where some countries are becoming more isolated and seeking to forge their own path with others. With this deadline extension and promises that deals are close, this is a chance for the WTO to prove it's still relevant. John Beaver, CGTN, Geneva. To discuss the future of the WTO, let's bring in our panel from New York. Yang Liang is Endowed Chair and Professor of Economics at Willamette University. From Sao Paulo, Gilson Schwartz is a Professor of Economics at the University of Sao Paulo. John Quelch is Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School. He joins us from Miami. And from Beijing, Henry Wong is founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization. Welcome to all of you. Yang Liang, let me start with you. This WTO ministerial meeting, it's taking place for the first time in four years. It was supposed to take place in 2020, but uh, that didn't happen because of COVID. But it's also taking place right now as the world faces a whole series of challenges. It's sort of a perfect storm, if you like. This is how the Director General of the WTO describes it. Let's listen to her. We're still trying to cope with a pandemic that has cost the world millions of lives. We have an international security crisis with the war in Ukraine. We have a major food crisis, an energy crisis. And we have an ongoing climate change crisis. So this poly crisis or simultaneous crisis is really unprecedented. So Liang, how do you see it? I mean, these are formidable challenges. Uh, is the WTO going to be able to get past them? Uh, good to talk to you, Anand. Um, so I think the Secretary General is absolutely correct um, that the world is now muddling through this poly crisis. And I think WTO could provide a viable multilateral platform to address some of these uh, you know, crises, some of these issues. Um, so this year, the uh, MC12 has many agendas um, that, for example, focus on um, ending fish sub, uh, subsidies that would help to curb overfishing. Um, also, some programs trying to cope with the uh, food crises. Um, also, questions about uh, digital trade tariffs. Um, and also, um, I think one very important question is how we can improve the vaccine assets by temporarily wavering um, some of the intellectual property rights protection on those vaccines. So I think this is a um, very important opportunities for many of these countries, 120 out of 164 member countries, um, to come together and come to some kind of consensus to address some of these very significant economic and social and health and uh, environmental crises.
John Crouch, there is an added challenge for the WTO, uh, and that is the global political divisions that uh, are very deep, and they've been around for some time, uh, but they've uh, been exacerbated during the pandemic, uh, for one, and now, of course, we've got the, uh, the conflict that's taking place between Ukraine and Russia. There were political uh, trade divisions, rather, before that, uh, the trade war between China and the United States. Do you think there is the political will uh, John, to look past these divisions, to find areas of common ground? Yes, I think there is an end, but at the same time, the north-south divide has been uh, perhaps exacerbated as a result of the uh, COVID and other crises that the Director General mentioned. Uh, and when you have that uh, greater economic divide, it makes it that much more difficult for emerging economies uh, uh, such as India to uh, give up on fish, uh, fishing subsidies for their millions of uh, uh, impoverished fishermen. Uh, and they're demanding a 25-year transition period uh, in terms of retention of subsidies. So it's ironic that at the very moment in time when all of these crises actually call for collaboration, uh, cooperation and consensus, uh, that it becomes that much harder to achieve. Uh, but I do believe the, there is a lot of respect for the uh, Director General. Uh, Ngozi Okonjo uh, Iwela has tried extremely hard to do a good job. And I think that uh, uh, the extra day is to some degree a reflection of the uh, member country ministers' uh, respect for her and their hope that something will come through uh, before, uh, uh, before the end of the meeting. And personally, I'm quite optimistic, uh, especially on the uh, vaccine patent issue, uh, where I think there has been considerable progress in the last two days. John, have we also seen protective barriers going up uh, because of things like the pandemic? Some countries are uh, not ex exporting health products, for instance, and we're seeing probably the same thing happening right now with the food shortages. Well, whenever there's a crisis, there's always uh, an instinct uh, on the part of some to uh, raise the bar of protectionism and uh, nationalist sentiment comes to the fore. Uh, I was struck by the fact the Director General did not really mention what I think is the most important uh, pending crisis, which is uh, that of potential famine in many African countries as a result of uh, the Russian blockade of Ukrainian grain exports uh, to, uh, to Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there, are, uh, there are even more pressing issues than um, uh, the general issues of e-commerce and uh, uh, fishery subsidies and so on that were mentioned earlier. But the WTO, as you said in your lead, is based on a consensus of 164 member countries. And, you know, as we know from our own experience as family members, getting 164 relatives to agree on anything would be next to uh, impossible. So its whole governance structure uh, is almost uh, a recipe for uh, failure from the outset. But just continuing to get people to talk and uh, to hold these meetings face to face uh, is in itself helpful, even if there isn't a consensus uh, result on every issue. Jilton Schwartz, the Financial Times had a lengthy piece about this ministerial meeting that's taking place and also uh, where the WTO is going right now. And it said that this meeting is happening, and these are the words the Financial Times used. They said it's happening in an era of fracturing multinational alliances, isolationist policies, and possible deglobalization. And, you know, we've talked about this before. You've written about this before. Um, is the world going to be breaking up into different blocks now? I think we are in an even worse situation because some time ago people talked about blocks, economic blocks, trade agreements. There was this dialectics, this uh, combination of uh, both regionalism and globalism. I think that we are now in a worse situation. It's not just uh, regional projects that are jeopardized. We now face a conflict between north and south, but also between east and west. And other uh, multilateral institutions have not done their job, they've not been uh, up to their challenges. You can mention 
you know, from the World Health Organization to the United Nations. Wherever you look, wherever you try to find some sort of path towards consensus, you see nothing. We are now going through a war economy. I'm quite skeptical, of course. I think that the leadership at the top now of the World Trade Organization is very important. She's a woman, she's black. She understands the challenges from a third world perspective. This is really very positive. But as a matter of fact, uh, this community, international community, should acknowledge that the market did not avoid the crisis. The market will not be the way out of this poly crisis, as she said. And Jocelyn, I mean, could the, uh, the move towards the globe breaking up into different blocks uh, be accelerated because of the fact, as John Crouch pointed out a moment ago, that we have 164 delegations that have to agree on these things? I think so. I think the fragmentation trend is now the stronger. And we're going to see also, in the midst of this fragmentation, the emergence of opportunities for new leaderships. Take, for instance, China or India or the BRICS. We've already discussed about this here. So I think this is not uh, exactly the same situation as we lived in the past, as the non-alignment movements took shape. But it's something that can uh, maybe muddle through the fragmentation, uh, creating more space for new leadership and new forms of alliances that are really uh, like the BRICS. They are really about taking care of large populations in large territories. Henry Wong, you wrote a piece in which you say that um, to save global trade, start small. And, you know, as we've just heard, the challenges right now are very daunting. But uh, how does the WTO achieve modest victories to make it more relevant? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. I, I think they actually, uh, you know, this is a long overdue. I mean, the, the ministerial meeting, I mean, last time was in Argentina, 2017. Uh, I was there. And uh, now, uh, probably four or five years later, and <laughs> they started to have this. But still, I mean, that symbolizes a very important, uh, 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 you know, on the ground gathering of, the, of a practical face to face meeting. I, 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 I heard that the minister locked in the room, I mean, be discussing, and then uh, the, the DJ has extended another day, which is, uh, which is great. I mean, we need to that kind of a heated uh, de debate and discussion. But, yeah, I, I agree with our previous uh, uh, panelists that, yes, this is really kind of, uh, I mean, still trying, but the, the outcome is, is very limited. As, 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 as a, a previous speaker mentioned, I mean, the leadership is important. I think we need a strong leadership for that. And then we, we see um, some countries was really uh, not really actively involved. So so we need really uh, to reboost WTO because fragmentation is, is, the, is the name of the game these days. You have a RCEP, you have a CPTPP, and you have many, many other, uh, you know, regional trade agreement uh, uh, proliferating on that. So WTO, the relevance of WTO is, is very important. It has drived the world, uh, uh, goes around, you know, for the prosperity for the last several decades. But mm -hmm. now it's time to really uh, enhance that. So I think, you know, it needs to start small. Yeah. Like the vaccine is really important. The vaccine, we should really, you know, the, the patent of, of, of IPR should be lifted. But also uh, the food, you know, I mean, the, we mentioned about famine and things like yeah. that. Also, one thing I think do have a bit of achievement. I was there in the WTO public forum right. uh, 20, 2019 about, uh, uh, you know, the plastic uh, in, in the pollution to the ocean. There is a resolution on that. 73 countries yeah, agreed to that. So, so there's some positive results. But we need really some concrete without to show the confidence and then to put, you know, put things forward. Right. Henry, that piece that you wrote in Bloomberg, you also say that the WTO needs to achieve some of its goals, no matter how small, so that it doesn't risk becoming irrelevant. I mean, how big is that risk of it becoming irrelevant? It, it is really, it is really, uh, uh, really, I, I think, uh, uh, highly <laughs> crucial now that uh, we need to uh, uh, concentrate on achieve something to, to give people the confidence and and uh, and and you know trust on the on the of the WTO. Also, I mean, uh, appellate body, you know, of, of WTO, and also how those big countries normally we need a leadership, we need a consensus. You know, like U.S., China, EU, you know, those key countries should play key roles in proposing agenda. I mean, if there's 164 countries, but most of them was follow the trend and, and really, you know, look for the leadership. I think there's a lack of leadership because if there's, you know, the three mm -hmm. major players if they're not really in the, in the same wavelength, that's not going to make things difficult. Right. Also, I think it's important that the WTO Secretary Office 
you know, should play more role rather than everything has to leave to the consensus of 164 countries. WTO secretary should be really empower them and then let them propose and really get something done, you know, quickly so that we can really uh, restore the confidence of the WTO and restore the confidence of world trade, particularly at the current uh, we are facing several crises, as WTO Direct General mentioned at the beginning. Yan Liang, there are many countries, in fact, uh, Henry Wong talks about it in his piece in Bloomberg, that are resorting to what he calls precautionism, uh, and that is, for instance, on the part of the United States, it's moving supply chains to more friendly countries. On the part of China, it's the dual circulation strategy, um, less dependence on imports, um, and an increase in domestic consumption. I mean, can we get back to the area of open free trade? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think what is happening with the U.S. and China is quite clear that the United States um, is the current administration um, is really inheriting that populism um, approach um, by the former Trump administration. Um, the idea is that, you know, we wanted to make sure that we are going to contain China's growth. We're going to not to subject ourselves to some kind of potential so-called threat um, from China. But I think all these idea of reshoring, uh, so-called brand shoring, uh, uh, to you know increase the supply uh, chain resilience in friendly countries, I think a lot of these is really not standing on the firm ground. I think it's much more politics than um, economics, um, and it's all you know in this sort of very vague idea of how to build um, supply uh, supply chain resilience. Because I think when you really think about it. Uh, when you bring all productions uh, back home or on site, um, what happened is that when something happened domestically, that's going to um, really uh, disrupt the supply chain a lot more easily. Um, I don't, if I can, I also wanted to make a very quick comment on the previous mm -hmm. speakers about you know the tensions between the north and the south, or um, the east and the, and the south uh, and, and the west. I think if we look at the specific issues, I think there are actually a lot of common grounds between um, these countries. Um, let's talk about environmental sustainability or um, COVID vaccine assets. I think all these are really global public interests. But what happened is there are all these um, you know vested interests. They're capturing. They're um, slowing down the negotiations and sort of consensus. Um, India's uh, position uh, talking about you know all these sub subsidies are for small um, artisanal kind of fishermen. Um, but if you look at really India is spending ten times more um, subsidies on the large scale fleet than the small. Um, scale fleet, um, and also t talking about the the timeline. Um, India is demanding 25 years, but we know that this negotiation has started in 2001, and now it's you know 20 years passed, and 400 billion dollars uh, harmful subsidies have been spent. Right. Um, so I don't think we still have more time um, to address these issues. Um, same with, you know, the pharmaceutical business interest. I think it's ridiculous to say they need more money, right? The two big pharmaceutical companies are expecting to rake in $50 billion of sales just this year. Um, and a lot of the money for the research um, are mm -hmm. coming from the government. It represents public interest. Right. So I, um, we do need to think about how to deal with these vast interest as opposed to just at the state level and talking about the vast, very abstract tensions um, from the north and the south. Jilton Schwartz, there was a study that was done by the WTO very recently in which it said that decoupling the global economy into two major blocks would result in a reduction of global GDP by something like 5%. I mean, what do you make of that assessment and can it be avoided? I would say that it's quite optimistic under the current circumstances for one reason. Besides the structural uh, decoupling, which is a real fact, or fragmentation, as we said, we are now in the midst of a short-term but very severe inflationary crisis. Uh, some people are already bringing back the old neologist, stagflation. That means we're going to live with inflation and stagnation at the same time, which clearly contradicts traditional, or let's say, orthodox economic theory. So the, the main scenario now for the next three to five years is that the United States, as we are already seeing this uh, take place, the United States will again raise interest rates. Investment flows will be also affected. Inflationary pressures will put central banks on the verge of a global crisis again, because all the, the, it's not only health issues related to pandemic, but also the contagion effect of recession and inflation all over the world. So I think that 
although we are talking about structural trends and major changes in the organization of the global system, as a matter of fact, it's not only a divide, but it's also a moment of deep diving into a most likely very severe recession with inflation over the next three to five years. Henry Wong, given that we are facing a food security crisis right now, I mean, how likely is it that countries that produce a lot of food uh, and other agricultural products could restrict their exports uh, of these kinds of foods? I mean, do you think there could be some kind of agreement at the WTO ministerial meeting to at least get a promise from these countries that they won't be doing that? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, there are several ways, of course, uh, we, we need to first uh, probably uh, lift the embargo on, on, on the port where Ukraine uh, grains can be exported. And that, that's probably the fundamental of the problem because that, you know, has uh, drive up all the food, food prices and, uh, and uh, also so everybody is trying, is really preventing that uh, shortage of food and then really uh, restrict their, their import export as well. So, so I think that has to be addressed. Uh, it's international. UN and WTO initiatives should really quickly, you know, we should pass some resolution for that, you know, and not not restrict the import export of, of the food. And and the second, I think that uh, uh, very important is that uh, you know we, we we really have to get some consensus going at at the WTO if that is the base for making a decision because we are not having a, a war going on, we are not having a pandemic going on. Yeah. What what big factors you need to really drive the consensus? Here here they are. So. So I think now, five, five years now, we have a first face-to-face -face minister meetings. It's really important that uh, uh, we, we look to see how the final declaration comes from, you know, the consensus they come. So, so this low hand food, we should really uh, grab them and uh, we should really give some confidence to boost uh, the economy and, and also the, the, the such crisis that we're having now. So, so I'm, I'm really, you know, cautiously but uh, optimistic, but I don't know. I mean, we're still waiting for the final result. John Crouch, when uh, President Trump came to office, of course, he adopted the policy of America first. And many of those policies that he initially implemented were retained by President Biden. And we even have Democrats now talking uh, about subsidies for domestic manufacturing, talking about ending incentives uh, that have encouraged people in the past to offshore critical supply chains. What kind of an effect could that have on the WTO? Uh, hopefully very little. Um, you know, the concept of uh, reshoring and onshoring, uh, the train has left the station. Uh, the law of comparative advantage in economics uh, will prevail. And in the end, uh, most consumers in most countries will want a good quality product at an affordable value price and uh, not be willing to pay much more uh, in order to be nationalistic about it. Uh, so. You know, my belief is that although there's a lot of uh, huffing and puffing on the political stage uh, about reshoring, uh, the practicality of doing so is uh, in many industries now quite limited, uh, and that uh, we should embrace the uh, benefits of uh, the international trading system that have, of course, lifted uh, um, tens of millions of people out of poverty over the last 25 years. Um, the rich may have got richer comparatively, but there are fewer people in poverty as a result of uh, globalization. There's no doubt about that. So um, although this particular meeting is perhaps a little bit strained, um, it all does begin by talking, Anand. And due to COVID, these folks have not been talking often enough. Um, Ministers change from one year to another. If you go five years without a meeting, there is a lack of continuity in the relationships among ministers across these countries. Um, and so you end up in a situation as we have it where there hasn't been sufficient pre-agreement before going into the public sessions. If you're running a good meeting, you would expect to have several wins already in your back pocket before you actually open uh, the door to the media. Uh, but that has not happened this time because yeah. there has been such a long, long time since the last meeting. Yan Liang, of course, this meeting is strained, as John says. But what do you think in the short term are the priorities for the WTO? 
Right. I think what is important, as um, some of the speaker mentioned earlier, um, there needs to be some small progress, um, some small steps towards rebuilding that, you know, trust um, in each country uh, in, in the WTO as a multilateral platform. And of course, it's also very important for um, the appellate body to be in some ways restored um, to handle some of these trade disputes. Um, but again, I think what is really important now is countries should really look at um, all these common challenges and think about the common interests. Um, take food as example, I think it's totally uh, you know, understandable that, you know, um, India demands a extension on the peace clause on, you know, the public stockholding. Um, but at the same time, I think there are countries who might have some excess capacity to be able to export to that world food program. And I think that, again, it's not only good for, you know, of course, the countries that are suffering from mm -hmm. food shortages. Uh, but eventually, I think that's what helped the global situation because right. you know, we don't want countries panic voting and so on and so forth. So I think it's important to really think about those public, um, you know, common ground yeah. and how to work through the WTO. Justin Schwartz, I've got about a minute left. You know, one of the important functions of the WTO, of course, is its dispute resolution mechanism. And in fact, um, Result took advantage of that. It got $300 million uh, from the United States because of cotton subsidies. Um, do you think that mechanism will survive? How important is it? I think it's very important. Brazil, for instance, has won a few battles. I think that maybe one of the reasons for the malfunctioning of the global multilateral institutions is exactly the fact that uh, in order to be faithful to their purpose, they should, uh, as a matter of fact, at the end of the day, they should really acknowledge the inequalities, the asymmetries between the more developed countries and the rest of the world. So a word of caution, I would say that the WTO is very important. Uh, we are expecting at least a minimal agreement um, as, the, the, as the show comes to an end. Mm -hmm. But one thing is to say, and the, another thing is to make it happen. OK, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CGT in America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter. That's at CGT in America. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.